It's the week of May 9th. Welcome to the Wild at Heart podcast. I'm Alan Arnold, and one of the things I really look forward to as producer is finding the right moments to return to a podcast with Craig McConnell's voice and insights. If you're a long-term listener to this podcast or a follower of this ministry, you already know who Craig McConnell is. If that name is not familiar to you yet, you're in for a real treat. Craig played a foundational role in the heart and soul of this ministry. And anyone that ever met him or spent time with him at one of our boot camps or any other interaction in person always left in a better place than when they started. His presence, his words, his laughter, his joy, you couldn't help but be transformed for the better from spending time with him. Now, this is a three-part series with John and Craig about exposing our idols. And in this first part, they look at what we give our souls to in the hopes of some return of life or peace or comfort. This series originally aired in May and June of 2016, right at about six years ago. And though we had no idea at the time, it ended up being Craig's final podcast series After a five-year battle with leukemia, Craig entered the kingdom in August of that same year. But in this series, he is full throttle (laughs) Craig McConnell. The laughter, the insights, the joy that he and John have together is contagious. And I hope you savor part one of this conversation. It's as timely as when it first aired. Now, here's Craig and John. Some friends advised to go sailing with them, and we were sailing in the Caribbean, and it really had so little to do with sailing, actually. It was all about just sleeping with the convertible top down and looking at the stars and rain squalls at night and the tropic air and warm, salty water floating like a turtle, if you could picture that. <laughs> you were the sea turtle? Yes. Yeah, just floating. Yeah. and But just, just life coming back and joy and just savoring and lingering in beauty. Oh, John, it was, it was like heaven. Mm. was heaven on earth mm. was what it was and uh it's Espe- just so refreshing oh especially after so much mm-hmm. just physical affliction and mm-hmm. then soul you know soul affliction to be in beauty to be in rest mm-hmm. to be out on the ocean mhm you know and it feels like those moments are so rare and they are And yet, when you're really in that sweet spot of just being renewed in the presence of God and the beauty, it's like that's what we were designed for. Isn't it? Yeah. (sighs) Friends, I think that if you'll flip back through your the photo album of your memory, that there are those moments. Yes. There are those moments. I'm just thinking of some family dinners we had last summer out on the deck candlelight, mm-hmm. moonlight, conversation, laughter, storytelling, just rare, rare moments with the family and our adult children. And, oh, gosh, those are the kinds of moments that you just, mm-hmm. you just wish would go on forever, mm-hmm. you know. And something in you just goes, I'm home. Like, I found it. Like, this is a taste of what I was meant for. I mm-hmm. <laughs> I have a funny confession. I'm beginning to develop an incredible sympathy for Imelda Marcos. <laughs> and her shoes? <laughs> and her shoes. <laughs> Stay with me. Listeners, if you are familiar with the story, Marcos, his wife Imelda, dictator of the Philippines back in the 70s and 80s, and she had this shoe fetish. And among the many problems and corruptions in the government, you know, they had this lavish lifestyle, which included she had thousands, 
lots of pairs uh -huh. of designer, high-end, Italian, Parisian shoes, right? Yeah. Acres. <laughs> Acres of shoes. And, you know, you look at those reports and you're like, that is just whacked. No, it's not. Like, when you begin to get in touch again with what your heart was made for, when you begin to just feel the ache mm -hmm. for how life was meant to be, Eden, paradise, yes. joy, happiness, love, goodness, wonder, beauty, feasting. I was just going to say food, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you understand stuff mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of pairs of shoes, like the human heart's ability to attach. Mm -hmm. And even the biochemistry of our bodies, the, our capacity for addiction says something really crucial about us. Yes. And it sets us up for a terrible dilemma, you know, because – I'm so glad you had that vacation. I mm -hmm. really am. And I'm so sorry it's over. Yeah. Yeah. Like wonderful moments that do not last. And then back to quote real life. And I hate that phrase, you know, mm -hmm. because it's not real life. You know, yeah. it's, it's east of Eden. Back to exile. <laughs> <laughs> like where do we take our hearts? You know, how do we not become Imelda Marcos? Like, yeah, yeah. We're introducing a conversation, friends, on idolatry that I think is going to be really helpful to all of us. Some reminders of some things you, you already know to be true and some insights into maybe some new categories for you. But you've got to start with, oh, my gosh, my heart, my soul is made yeah. for beauty and joy and yes. those great moments. Mm -hmm. Well, when we were on these highlands, met a couple of people who lived there. And I'm thinking, that's the secret. Oh. Got to live here. Oh. oh, can you imagine this 365 days a year? So we're talking to him and he goes, oh, man, it gets so old. It is so hard what? to live here. He, what? he only comes uh, to the island seasonally because he just can't take it. I'm going, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> You're messing with, yeah. my, with my dreams. If only. <laughs> if only. Oh, John, you know, a quote on what we're talking about here that's always just captured my understanding of addiction is um, by Maurice Robertson. And uh, he said, ecstasy and delight are essential to the believer's soul, and they promote sanctification. We were not meant to live without spiritual exhilaration. And the Christian who goes for a long time without the experience of heartwarming will soon find himself mm. tempted to have his emotions satisfied from earthly things and not, as he ought, from the Spirit of God. The soul is so constructed that it craves fulfillment from things outside itself, and it will embrace earthly joys for satisfaction when it cannot reach spiritual ones. The believer is in spiritual danger if he allows himself to go any length of time without tasting the love of Christ and savoring the felt comforts of a Savior's presence. When Christ ceases to fill the hearts with satisfaction, our souls will go in silent search of other lovers. Mm. Yeah, and that's one of those, oh, man, quotes. <laughs> you know, it's like, dang, it's true. I mean, like, even just to be reminded of a couple big ideas of like, wait a second, like pleasure and happiness and joy are essential to sanctification. Like just that thought. Yeah. Well, and he says ecstasy. I can go with pleasure and satisfaction and joy, but ecstasy, it feels like a level up. No, it's true. It's true. We were just with some guys at a boot camp, and one of the things we do is uh, we pray through our sexuality 
consecrating, cleansing, healing our sexuality. And I was just so struck by why is that such a powerful snare? Like, why does that work? Well, it's because of ecstasy. You know, we'll use words like eroticism or, you know, baser things like mm-hmm. pornography to describe it. But no, it's like the soul, the soul craves love, mm-hmm. ecstasy, joy, happiness, mm-hmm. evenings on a sailboat in the Caribbean mm-hmm. or whatever your version of that is. That, yeah. You know, that was a perfect fit for Craig and Laurie and for some much needed restoration. But we all have our version of that that we think if only it could go. 365 days a year. You yeah. know, if we could just get there, we'd nail it. Yeah. Well, if I can't get the Caribbean on a sailboat, going 70 down the freeway, eating a bag of Cheetos is a close second. <laughs> <laughs> it's embarrassing. If we'll just be frank for a moment, like what we will do to try yeah. and somehow ease the ache, mm-hmm. it may not satisfy it. What we will do to just try and get a little something. Mm-hmm. And I loved Robert's last line there about the soul will go in silent search for other lovers. Yeah. You read the prophets, and I love Phil Yancey's expression. It sounds like listening to a lover's quarrel through the apartment wall. Like, God is upset. You have been unfaithful to me. Right. And, yeah. and and he's ranting. He's like, has anybody ever seen this before? Has anybody ever heard of this? That a people abandon their God and go, in, you know, in search of these idols. And he talks about abandoning the fountain of living water and Jeremiah and digging broken cisterns. Like he's he's clearly upset. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's the upsetness of a spurned lover. Mm-hmm. Of a betrayal. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was reading a passage this morning uh, where Isaiah is rebuking the people and say, you cut down a tree that you've watered and nurtured and grown and you burn half of it to keep warm and then you carve the other half and worship it. It's God. <laughs> and it's like, you know, the idiocy of it, he tries to expose. You know. I love the Gospel of John. I love his letter. It's at the end of 1 John. He has this beautiful kind of last word to us. 1 John 5, the end of the the epistle. Last two verses. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Last verse. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. Yeah. End of the letter. And you go, wait a second. Like, the first John as a letter is absolutely incredible. The love of God, mm-hmm. your identity in Christ, who you are as a child of God, the victory, the promises. He gets down to the end. The last thought, you can just see the old guy writing away maybe even dictating. And his last thought is, oh, by the way, keep yourself from idols, Mm -hmm. dear ones, dear children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why do you suppose he lays that out there at the end? Wow. Well, there's some link, obviously, between the worship of idols and the life we so deeply want to live and we're designed to live, and there is no enjoying or living that life apart from intimacy with God. And the idolatry can feel so subtle, but it will keep you from that life. Yep. You know, one of the things I was struck by in Isaiah was, In 44, Isaiah says that when we look to idols, that God smears our eyes 
so that we can't see clearly. And it's like you start going down the road of another god and you can't be objective. You can't see clearly. No. Your appraisal of your world, your condition, your everything. Oh, there's is always an changed. excuse. Yeah. There's always an excuse. There's yeah. always a reason. So pause. Friends who are listening along with us, could you name a few? Could you name a few of your idols, the things you go to for a taste of, yes, yes, what your heart was meant for, of course. These things have a pull for a reason, for heaven's sakes. They're not idols. They're not false gods because they don't work, yeah. right? There's yeah. a taste there. There's an experience. There's a little something. So as we're tracking along, let's pull this out of the theoretical. Friends, can you name a few of the places you go, the things you cling on to, what you give your heart over to. And the fascinating thing is, if you can't rattle off <laughs> at least the leading contenders. Oh, I thought you were going to say 15 or 20. <laughs> <laughs> what does that say yeah. about that delusion, Craig, yeah. about that lack of clarity? Like mm -hmm. if we just pause for a moment, just be honest and say, okay. Where do I go? One of the things God was revealing again to me was a very surprising idol, I think, to some people, ministry. Like those who are in the ministry, those who are ministers of the gospel, make idols of their work or of the ministry or of what you know, and all that's connected to it, the praise that comes yeah. your way, you know, yeah. the adoration of people, the influence you have. Mm -hmm. and, and Jesus just saying, could you walk away from it all tomorrow? Mm -hmm. John, could mm -hmm. you just literally walk away and go work at Home Depot? Could you do that? That kind right, of question yeah. exposes really quickly what's getting tangled up in there. Yeah, that's good. You know, when I think of the question, where do I turn, I immediately went to the question of where do I turn when I'm under pressure, when things are hard or difficult, or I'm not feeling well. And I mean, where I go is one is food. Oh, the comfort that brings. And I mean, that just changes my body chemistry, mellows me out. I'm good. Oh, yeah. Releases endorphins. You're yeah. happy. Come on. Hey, got a piece of pound cake <laughs> over the triune god. <laughs> okay. Okay. Fred's little footnote. One of our favorite lines is from the movie. Is it Ernest Saves the World? Something smally. Anyway, there's this great line where he's called his therapist. He's in crisis. He's called his therapist. And his therapist says to him, can you get to a pound cake? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's so funny about that? It works. Yes, it does. Like literally chemically within inside of you. These things, they trigger reactions. There's a release of the, you know, the neurochemicals that bring peace and comfort and Right? Yeah, I'd put it. It just tastes good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're trying to encourage you to name a few of your idols. This is another kind of surprising one for me. Like, it feels so legitimate. I just don't even want to name it as an idol. But order. Mm. Things as they ought to be. I put in quotation marks. Things as they ought to be. So... I'm just amazed at when I'm feeling unsettled, restless, unfilled, you know, that condition that Roberts was describing in that quote about, it's been a while since I've been filled by God yeah. or his kingdom or the gifts of heaven. If I could just fix everything, just fix the chaos, reduce chaos and going to order mm -hmm. and even further into that, what I'm actually after is beauty. Yeah. I want things to be beautiful my home, my office, my yard, if I can just achieve the presence of beauty, there's just this kind of rest that comes to my soul. Mm. And 
again, let me say, of course, our hearts were made for beauty. You're made for Eden. Like, that's not the issue, gang. The mm-hmm. issue is, what is the function it's serving, mm-hmm. right? It's not the gift of the vacation to you guys, beauty on the water as a gift mm. from God. Mm-hmm. It's arranging for, grasping for a desperate soul trying to fill itself mm-hmm. kind of beauty. It's order in order to get to beauty yeah. can be this huge idol for me. Yeah. Boy, I'm all for order. I was working in my garage this weekend and I went through about four boxes of baggies just – you know, I've got a box of just hardware, loose screws, and nails, little widgets, mm-hmm. and I decided that the best thing to do with this mess, which is my life, uh, is to organize it. <laughs> and it was remarkable how much better I felt after putting things in baggies and then putting them in a container, clearly marked miscellaneous hardware. And what was so funny, Judd, was it was like geologic layers in this storage box of previous times where I've organized things. And I didn't even know I had this crap. You know, it's just piles of bags with stuff in it. And they're labeled miscellaneous hardware. And I feel good. And so there's something about order. Mm. And then another one for me is just isolation. The best way to deal with stress for me is just Kind of check out. Oh, absolutely. Dissociate. Well, not that serious, but <laughs> it's just. I'm, it, I'm giving a personal confession. <laughs> uh, yeah, but just find some reason to check out. I'm tired. I'm this. I'm that. And just to be away and alone. It's a little more kosher in the Christian community mm-hmm. than. Mm-hmm. Than having the third cocktail or, right. or whatever. Right. Although the third cocktail works. It works too. It's a handy alternative. Oh, man, I'll tell you what. It is a good thing too that God got a hold of my drinking a few years ago because otherwise when you take what your heart is made for and then you put it in this world, like this experience of the partial and the not yet and – Oh, my gosh. We are fish out of water, just uh, just mm-hmm. gasping. Our gills are flapping. We're just, uh, you know, sucking for mm-hmm. the environment that we were made for. And, yeah, we are idle factories. Yeah. We are. We will create them. And some of the things we've just described can sound really benign. Order. Come on, guys. Beauty. Give me a break. You know, it's the – Sexual addictions, it's the chemical addictions, it's the things that people destroy their lives over. Yeah, we get it. Yeah. We get it. I came really close to that with alcohol for sure. Again, the addictive capacities of the human being, biologically, neurologically, but also soulfully, just point us to we are worshiping beings created for paradise. Yeah. And therefore, If we do not have a life in God that is sustaining us now, Mm -hmm. and we do not have a genuine hope of the coming kingdom, like the paradise really is coming to us, of course we're going to create idols. Are you kidding me? You can't live without that. Mm -hmm. And the scriptures are pretty, pretty strong Mm -hmm. on what idolatry does to us the havoc that it wreaks in our lives and what it does to our relationship with God. So I think what we'll do is pick up the second part of this conversation next time and just leave you kind of beginning to wonder in some of these categories, friends. Yeah, what do I do? I'm Emil DeMarcos. Mm -hmm. What are my shoes, right? What am I giving my soul to in hopes of some return of Life, peace, joy, comfort, assurance, protection. What is it? You've been listening to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. John Eldridge and Craig McConnell in a conversation on, oh, everything our souls were made for, basically, and the danger of idolatry. We'll pick it up next time. <laughs>